by Nantesbach and from the Polizzi Valley near Zanin in the Limpopo province in South Africa. The first time we noticed the parrots was in 2007. Um, there's only two or three parrots flying over making a lot of noise. In 2008 was the first time that we noticed big numbers flying around and that year we counted up to 105 parrots in one flyover and since then we've had between 20 and 40 parrots on a daily basis flying around Amarinchester. Since day one we've basically been telling our staff that it is endangered um, species and they can't just go around killing the parrots. Um, we've also got a farm school um, called Telefa Combined School and we have been educating the children as well um, about the importance of having these parrots around. There are less than a thousand of these parrots still alive around the world and sometimes as I said we notice up to a hundred here which is 10% of the total population. So here we are in the morning just getting ready to go into uh, Talifa School here in the Paletsi Valley. Uh, Talifa School is basically the school for the children of the farm workers uh, that work on all of the farms. Yeah, we came down uh, last week and we gave the kids a bit of a project to learn as much as they can about the Cape Parrots. So they're going to do a presentation to us, what they've learned about the habitat, the ecosystem and what can be done to preserve these parrots. Our visitors here, they learned, by the way they are from Switzerland or Swaziland, New Zealand, <laughs> New Zealand and, England. and England. Okay, they are from New Zealand and England. <laughs> Yeah, so here we're with Tabitsu from the local Talifa school and have you been learning about parrots this week? Yes. Do you know uh, why, there are, why there are not many parrots? Because here around us people are killing them. Yeah? They see them as meat. They see them as meat? Yes. Are there many yellowwood trees left? No, I don't think so because they cut yellow trees. Yeah. Because they will make fire with the yellow trees. Yeah. We don't see them around here. Yeah. That's why we don't have so many parrots. That's a real shame. So if we can get more yellowwood trees, we might, we might get more parrots. Yes, because yeah. they love to stay in the yellow trees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they eat yellow each foods. So Rose, you're the headmistress of Talifa School, and you've spent the past week talking to all the children about the cave parrots. How important do you think it is to pass the knowledge on to the children? It is very important to pass the knowledge to the children because we need to, to, to uh, safe keep these uh, parrots. They are endangered species. Otherwise the next generation will not know them. That mm. is the, the most problem. I tried to interview some of the kids here. They don't know them. Even myself, I've never seen it alive. I only saw it in the internet. Are the yellowwood trees, are they still chopped down? in the local area or are there, are there none left to chop them? <coughs> I don't think there are any more left. Yeah. We don't have yellow trees here. Yeah. Unless maybe in the dark bushes of Mahova's roof. But around, around here I've never seen one. Because we, uh, myself and David, we walked up into the bush for a couple of hours yesterday and in four hours we maybe saw two yellowwood, two, three yellowwood trees and that was really up in the forest. So there, are just, there just aren't many yellowwood trees left anymore. So they've cut down for wood. Yeah, they're, they're that, is, that is what I know. Yeah, mm. yeah. And they're such a slow growing tree, aren't they? Yeah, so yeah. you can see that uh, our, our cave parrots are endangered species. Mm -hmm. The first boxes were made out of cocos palm stems. They were put up in 2009. And <coughs> we didn't get them high enough to start with. And secondly, the cocos palm rots very quickly and with our high rainfall of about 1,400 millimeters of rain per year, um, it only lasted about two years and we realized that they were not right, made from the right material. So we decided that we will have to get more permanent boxes and this is what we're doing now is installing more permanent boxes higher up in the trees.
stepped away from the uh, following the river just because walking on those rocks is an absolute nightmare. Um, so we've sort of headed up the hill slightly. Trees seem a lot bigger here. But uh, it's not as dense, is it? No, it's not as dense. Uh, there's less chance of breaking an ankle on the river rocks. That's one of the biggest dangers for us. <laughs> <laughs> had, a, had a few close calls. It's not the place to be breaking an ankle. No. But walking up, we heard uh, on there a couple of Cape parrots deep in the bush. So that's quite nice. That makes us quite keen to come back with more ropes. Put some ropes up in the trees, get settled up there and see if we can see them when they're leaving their roosts, coming back to roost and checking out some monkeys. And But no, I think now we go back to the base, load up with some bigger bags, get some more climbing gear and try and retrace our steps, which may be impossible, but as long as we keep going uphill near the river, we should end up roughly the same place. And yeah, get the throw lines, the big shot, try and get some ropes up and uh, then come back tomorrow with all the harnesses and the hammocks and food and get settled for a couple of days up here. The most frequent questions we get asked is how do we actually get the ropes into the tree to uh, allow us to climb the tree? Well, what we use is a small bag which has lead shot in it. They weigh roughly between six and 10 ounces. Uh, we also use thin line, 1.5 mil roughly. And what we do is use a giant slingshot. Now this is not a toy, it is actually a tool. Um, they can be quite fun. But um, what we do is put the bag inside this, fire it up into the canopy, and then we attach our rope to the throw bag or to the line itself, and then hoist that into the tree and pull our rope over. Once our rope's over, get two people to jump on it, make sure it's over something sufficient to hold our weight, and then we're away, climbing. It's as simple as that. This is the very tip of this Matumi canopy. I'd say 30, 32 meters roughly. And from the ground, this is the anchor point that we threw. Uh, might look quite skinny to a lot of people, but uh, it's pretty damn substantial. You can see the rope comes through this one, down through that one, and keeps going down. So. If this anchor point would have failed, we have plenty of backup anchor points, but it can be a little bit hit and miss. We uh, check all our anchor points before we climb on them. Two people check, two people bounce, uh, but you still don't know. Uh, it's one of the dangers of doing this kind of thing, but it's also one of the dangers that's, that allows us to do this kind of thing. Um, it's pretty specialized. Not many people 
enjoy it. Not many people like to do it, but for us, we can't. I don't know. I can't imagine doing anything else. But uh, yeah, this looks like a beautiful, beautiful open canopy to try and put some Cape Parrot bird boxes up. We've got two for this tree. Yeah, so the boxes have um, steel eyelets on them. Uh, we'll hoist them up into the tree. I'll follow uh, Drew up and follow the boxes up and uh, together we'll attach it to the tree using uh, galvanised wire. Again, stop it rusting and hopefully they'll stay up there for a good number of years. Yep, so I'm just going to go over now and look at the parrot box we just installed. It's about 30 metres in this Matumi. As you can see, there's a lot of dead wood in this tree. All this is dead. It's about uh, 28 metres, 30 perhaps. We'll say 30. Yep, so this is one of the parrots. This is one of the parrot boxes. Uh, we have chose this location. Nice and open. Parrots can come in nice and easy. It's facing away from the uh, prevailing wind and rain. So uh, you shouldn't actually get any water going inside it. And what we've noticed is on here, this is worn along here. And this looks like parrot beaks. We've got claw marks. So a bird, and hopefully it's the Cape Parrots, have been resting on here. And if they've been resting on here, they're quite inquisitive. They, hopefully, will come and have a quick look in here. So yeah, I think this is a pretty good location. Open, they can fly in nice and easy, get away from predators. Because there are hawks, hawks and eagles around here. Uh, whether they predate on them, we don't actually know. But it's all this that's really interesting. Uh, here it's definitely been worn, it might be them cleaning their beaks but that's that's not natural, you know, that shouldn't be worn here and here and these scrape marks are really interesting so we've got this one here and uh, yeah, let's put another one in in this old Matumi, this Matumi is about 950 years old it's, uh, is this number 9 on the champion tree register? I think so, roughly. Yeah. Number nine, so here yeah, it's an old tree. Let's see what happens. Come back in a year and hopefully there's some parrots in there. It's not just about the protection of these parrots for us, it's part of the bigger picture. Um, we've got the indigenous forests with the big Matumi trees and we're trying to conserve the forests and the parrots and nature in general um, for our children and our grandchildren and therefore we are educating the school children, the farm labour and hopefully through our efforts it will spread to the farming communities around us and not just our farm.